it's not just some bad attitude that psychiatrists were harming people. It's a scientific fact that back in the 80s, eight of all the people on antipsychotics for a long period of time, 20% had brain damage from the medications that was causing them to have abnormal twitching, grimacing, shaking movements. Mm -hmm. It's simply a scientific fact. It's not a matter of being against psychiatry. Life, wisdom. Dr. Ross, in some of the comments on our videos, we have been accused of being anti-psychiatry, but you're a psychiatrist. So I'm wondering, are you an anti-psychiatry psychiatrist? Can you tell us what anti-psychiatry is? Uh, actually, I can't really tell you because it isn't any defined thing. But here's an analogy I would make. Let's say you're a pretty solid Republican. So therefore, you're against the Democrats who are currently in power. Does that mean you're against government? Or what if you're a solid Democrat and you're against the Republicans who are currently controlling the House, the Senate, and the White House? Does that mean you're against government? No, you're critical of the current form of the government. Okay. So that's basically how I see it. With, I'm, unless I've got some really strange you know, conflict with myself, I'm, I am a psychiatrist. I make a living as a psychiatrist. I publish papers regularly in psychiatry journals. I talk at psychiatry conferences. I attend psychiatry conferences. Mm -hmm. I'm not an anti-psychiatrist. I'm critical of the current form of psychiatry. And so there's a huge difference. And the, the sort of propaganda trick that gets played is if you are critical of psychiatry, like take Thomas Sass, for instance, who's very critical of psychiatry and wrote a book called The Myth of Mental Illness. Well, when I was in training in psychiatry, the only mention of Thomas Sass was, oh, he's that anti-psychiatrist. He's a fringe kook. He thinks that schizophrenia is just a myth. That was it. That's all I heard about Thomas Sass. So then I actually read the book, and lo and behold, it's a very scholarly, very intelligent, very well-argued analysis of the mental health field, mm -hmm. whether you agree with it or disagree with it. Um, but that gets nailed in this little box of anti-psychiatry. So anybody who questions the current doctrine that dominates psychiatry automatically becomes an anti-psychiatrist, fringe lunatic. So that's just a, a propaganda trick. Right. And it insulates the profession from any serious criticism. But what is a scientist supposed to do? Is a scientist supposed to say, I automatically believe that just because you told me? No, a scientist is supposed to say, well, okay, let's look at the evidence. What does the research show? Let's look at the data. Let's balance it. What additional research do we need to do? Mm -hmm. When you take that rational, medical, scientific, reasonable stance, and you look at the information in psychiatry, you automatically see that it's very, 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 very shaky. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a double twist around. So I'm an anti, anti, anti psychiatrist or something like that. Because it's not that I'm against psychiatry. I think that the current form of psychiatry is actually harming and damaging psychiatry and is toxic to the profession, and I'm against that self-destructive influence from inside psychiatry. So I'm actually pro-psychiatry, and I'm anti the current pro-psychiatry, which is actually anti-psychiatry, if you can see how it's so twisted around. Right, definitely. But I don't know if that makes it clear, but that's basically my, my position on it. So when you say that you're critical of certain aspects of psychiatry, can you explain that in a little more detail? Yeah, as we've talked about in other videos, um, I'm critical from the perspective of what is it that's actually biologically, medically, scientifically true here? And what's being put forth by biological psychiatry just isn't scientifically true. It's not a scientific fact that these are medical diseases. It's not a scientific fact that we've identified genes or sets of genes that cause specific psychiatric disorders. It's not true that medications are powerful and effective. It's not true that there's identified chemical imbalances. These things simply are not scientifically true. So the problem is when you make this kind of commentary, you can very easily get put in the box of being an anti-psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. 
So anti-psychiatry is just kind of a box that's used to dismiss people who are critical of the field. There isn't actually any organized anti-psychiatry movement. Mm -hmm. So it's not really a thing that even exists. It's just kind of a little chess move in a game. Right. And certainly anytime you have a whatever it might be, in this case psychiatry, we have a field and there are people with skepticism about the claims made by certain professionals in that field, there's going to be a, a certain, you know, ad hominem attack on anybody who's making those criticisms. And I think what you described about Thomas Zaz is very, um, is a perfect example because here, everything you were told about him, oh, he's a fringe, he's a lunatic, he's this crazy guy, not even worth looking at anything he said. And you ended up actually going and reading the book yourself and seeing that well, none of those things are true. That was just an attack on this guy and in no way refuted the information that he had put forth in that, in that book. Exactly. Which is a general problem that you can see on cable TV seven days a week, which is our culture is less and less and less and less able to tell the difference between a debating point and an analysis and an emotional reaction. So we tend to have a debate equals this extreme emotional reaction, and then this extreme reaction, that extreme reaction, and this anti-psychiatry thing is more like that. It's just mm -hmm. kind of an emotional reaction and a blanket dismissal. It's not actually something that exists. It's not part of a real scientific inquiry into mental illness and what to do about it. So if it's just this, uh, perhaps, certain aspects of psychiatry that you are critical of, that you are skeptical of. Can you kind of pinpoint, you know, where that's coming from or where those certain claims are, are rooted perhaps? Well, these claims have been in psychiatry since the 19th century. There's always a school that's more over on uh, genes, biochemicals, disease model. And then there's always a faction that's more over towards it's psychological, it's got to do with your experience, and we're going to treat it with psychotherapy. So it's just a timeless dichotomy in the field of psychiatry. The nature versus nurture right. debate. And it goes back to Freud and before Freud. But what happens now is we've got the biological psychiatry model in a, in a simple kind of fashion, totally dominating the field. And we have something now that we didn't have in Freud's time, which is... When I say massive, I mean billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars in the pharmaceutical industry, massively reinforcing this model. Mm -hmm. So now we've got uh, the more the disease models bought, the more the genetic model, the more the chemical imbalance model, the more the powerful medications, the more money the drug companies make, and the more they feed back to psychiatry. So there's massive financial reinforcement and support for it. Wow. And then we've just got an attempt by psychiatrists to try and become equal doctors along with internists and surgeons. And I think it's backfiring. I don't think it's working. So when you talk about um, these billions and billions of dollars that are, are spent, are you referring to, I guess, the, the marketing and advertising on behalf of these pharmaceutical companies? Uh, there's several, well, the billions includes the profits. So there's billions and billions and billions in sales. Mm -hmm. There's billions spent on marketing. And there's over decades billions spent on this kind of genes, chemical imbalance type research. Mm -hmm. So we've got billions of dollars shifted away from psychological, social into biological. We've got billions of dollars inserted into the media to reinforce Nobody on CNN is going to complain about the medical model of psychiatry if that means losing all this revenue. Then when the insurance companies are bought in, we just got all these social forces mm -hmm. really locked into this model now. Right. And I think that we can observe that there are lots of pharmaceutical ads on television, lots of pharmaceutical ads in magazines. And so as you're describing, well, here is our evidence that these companies have a lot of influence on the media. And so certainly somebody in the media isn't going to say something that would not make the pharmaceutical companies happy or be critical of the pharmaceutical companies um, because they would probably lose their job. 
Right, and then what you see is occasionally if an anti-psychiatry person is interviewed on one of the cable networks, say, they tend to select somebody who comes off as kind of a radical nut. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes easy to say, oh, that guy's just a radical nut. He doesn't have anything to say that makes any sense. He's an anti-psychiatrist, and then we're back to the status quo. Right. And so, yeah, it's all a giant propaganda campaign, basically. Mm -hmm. So are there other people out there? You mentioned Thomas Saws. Are there other people out there that you might say are anti-psychiatry or that are critical of the current role of psychiatry? Well, there's people out there who would be called anti-psychiatrists, mm -hmm. but I want to take that label off of them. So there's people who are critical of psychiatry, uh, Peter Bregan, uh, Mind Freedom, uh, as many people know, Scientology through its organization, CCHR, is highly critical of psychiatry. But that automatically just gets put in the, oh, they're Scientologist box. Mm -hmm. And Be again, the ad hominem attack. Right. Oh, don't listen to them. Don't go listen to what they have to say. They're just nutty. And so that's all just part of the, the sort of social game that's going on here. Mm -hmm. But I think individual people, more like consumers and individual citizens, they're not driven by some sort of theory of mental illness. They're driven by really bad experiences that they and their loved ones have had with psychiatry, mm -hmm. which is uh, rude psychiatrists, very unprofessional behavior, spending a very short amount of time, all this stigmatizing biological psychiatry message to get this delivered, and then prescribing meds that are not very helpful, have lots of side effects, and then adding on more meds, mm -hmm. increasing the dose, and having really serious bad problem, which again is not an anti-psychiatry statement. It's simply a fact, if we go back to when I was in training, of all the people taking antipsychotic medications on a long-term basis, 20% developed a long-lasting neurological disorder called tardive dyskinesia. Mm -hmm. So it's not just some bad attitude that psychiatrists were harming people. It's a scientific fact that back in the 80s, eight of all the people on antipsychotics for a long period of time, 20% had brain damage from the medications that was causing them to have abnormal twitching, grimacing, shaking movements. Mm -hmm. It's simply a scientific fact. It's not a matter of being against psychiatry. Um, and so then we're back to what's a reasonable, rational criticism at a more kind of theory level and what's a reasonable, rational criticism based on the experience you actually had with psychiatry? Mm -hmm. For instance, sexual misconduct by mental health professionals is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. It gets very little attention. And what you're saying really actually kind of fits home for me personally, because my own journey with psychiatry and initially starting to become skeptical of psychiatry uh, was because of an experience that my mom had and seeing what she went through, seeing how the drugs affected her, and seeing that many of the things that were being put forth to us in the media actually were not at all in congruence with what she experienced. And um, another example that comes to mind is, is Gwen Olson, who's also been interviewed on this channel. She had horrendous experience with psychiatry, where her niece actually ended up committing suicide. Uh, her, her very bright niece um, at the age of 20. And so you can see that, oh, well, yeah, if you have a very negative and traumatic experience with psychiatry, understandably, you would become somewhat skeptical of it. To say the least. And there's a, another cruel twist that's put on it. So if we look at what happened to the Edsel, the Ford car that was a complete disaster, we don't go... People wouldn't buy it because they were mentally ill. We just go, it was a lousy product and consumers wouldn't buy it. Mm -hmm. But in the mental health field, if we look at in you know, these long-term large studies, 75 to 80% of people drop out of the study, whether it's antipsychotics or antidepressants or mood stabilizers. Mm -hmm. Only a quarter of people even consume the product for a year and a half. So then the explanation from Skytree is, well, that's because they lack insight, they're mentally ill, they're in denial. But another possible explanation is, it's not a rational consumer choice. Mm -hmm. The cost-benefit is negative. Right. Now, it's not going to be all one, all the other. 
So I've certainly met lots of people who have serious problems, are in total denial about it, aren't going to get any kind of help of any form. Mm -hmm. But again, psychiatry just puts it all in the box of, well, they won't take the meds because they're mentally ill or because they're in denial or because they lack insight. So we have to educate them even more that they have a biological disease. But maybe a lot of these people are just not buying the product because it's not a very good product. And the product being the medication and the amount of time you get to spend with a psychiatrist and the quality of the interaction. And then what happens when you're admitted to a hospital? How are you treated? So can you give us some recommendations of, of the alternative? Because based on my experience, it was an issue where my family really didn't know what to do. We didn't feel that there were a lot of options. We didn't really understand that there, that were, there were any options other than giving her these medications and just writing it out to see what happened. And it wasn't until that she had a um, very traumatic episode that we were able to agree that never would have happened if it wasn't for these, these so-called medications. Uh, that was kind of the wake-up call for us to say, hey, wait a second. Maybe this isn't the most effective treatment method. I don't have a really practical, really good solution. Go here, do this, problem solved. Uh, it's a very entrenched, very big problem in our culture. But the basic recommendation I would make is be an informed consumer. Ask questions. And if you just get sort of an enraged reaction or a dismissive reaction or a condescending reaction, see if you can find somebody else. I mean, there's, psychiatrists aren't all good or all evil. Right? There's more reasonable ones, less reasonable ones. Right. And certainly, as is illustrated in this video, um, you've got some psychiatrists who will just um, assume the talking point, so to speak, oh, these drugs are safe and effective, I'm going to diagnose you out of the DSM and kind of go through the motions. Um, and then you have a psychiatrist like you, Dr. Ross, who is is really concerned with, with trying to help the patient, recognizing that, that the drugs aren't always safe or effective, and actually going yourself, doing your, your own research to, to see which of these claims are substantiated and which are not. So I think that's um, really hopeful, gives us hope that we will be able to find people who can give us help, who are really concerned with with helping us and not just selling us some drugs and making a little bit of profit. Um, and then if we just look around a little bit, we will be able to find those people. It's a challenge though. Right. And uh, then of course, we've got the whole world of alternative medicine and just lifestyle options that you can investigate on your own. Mm -hmm. But I would like to see the profession shift a long ways away from the way it typically operates now to a much more balanced, psychological, social kind of model. Mm -hmm. And I think you made a really good point, kind of illustrating that, well, in the history of, of psychiatry, there have been the two schools of thought, the biological, chemical side, and the, the psychological, experiential, nature versus nurture kind of debate. Um, and I think that your kind of visual image of the pendulum swinging just so far to the side of the biological chemical thing that, yeah, maybe if it can just come back a little more central so that we're not only dependent on the drugs, everyone's receiving these, these prescriptions, um, that we might actually have a much more effective mental health treatment. I agree. And uh, just from the preservation of the profession, sort of self-protection of the profession point of view, the danger here is that psychiatry is de-skilling itself and shrinking down its range of expertise and what it has to offer mm -hmm. to such a small little domain of interventions that really aren't all that effective, that have lots of side effects. That's bad for the survival of psychiatry. It's not even in the like selfish best interest of the profession to keep going down this track that we're on. Wow. Well, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you. And thank you for watching this video. Please leave us a comment and let us know your thoughts or your future video requests. Be sure to subscribe to the Psyche Truth channel so you can catch our future videos. We are dedicated to helping you take control of your health and happiness. 
I'm Psyche Truth correspondent Karina Rachel. Thank you for watching.